Appeal number 76, the people of the state of New York versus Daryl Spencer. Good afternoon, Your Honors. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, please. Could you say three? Thank you. Three? Yes. You may. Yes. Uh, Susan Salomon for Mr. Spencer. Uh, it's been a long-held requirement by this court that a juror must be able to set aside his or her emotions and be able to deliberate the case dispassionately and fairly. Uh, we believe it was also paramount in this particular case given the emphasis by the parties and the court during voir dire of the potential for emotions to override the, that ability in this case. Counsel, you're not yep. chal challenging the sufficiency of the court's inquiry and colloquy yes. with this juror, yes. correct? You're yes. only, this is based solely on the actual words spoken. Yes, by this, by this juror, yes, the words spoken. And we believe that this juror, as indeed the appellate division majority found, was honest, was forthright, and was clear about what was troubling her. Counsel, the, the yeah. standard for discharging a seated juror is grossly unqualified. And I think anybody who reads this, it's a troubling transcript here. Um, and the back and forth continues for time, and there's never I think as you focus very appropriately in your, your papers, there's never an unequivocal statement that, yes, I can put this aside. There's kind of a cutoff and, and some other back and forth. But what I'm somewhat concerned about is grossly unqualified is, is a high standard. And if you look at our cases, it's <coughs> talked about where a juror expresses racist views, right? That would interfere with their ability to be fair. Here, rather than looking at the unequivocal, I uh, can be, looking at what the juror has said is the problem. It seems to be very different than what we've ever found is grossly unqualified in the sense that I can't separate my emotions from the case. And obviously there are things in this case that would be disturbing to anyone and just in terms of the nature of the crime. So my concern is how do we fit that representation within our case law on grossly unqualified? Well, I think first, uh, as this court's other cases have said, for example, May, Mayhaus, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, the court gave as in examples, but as examples only, of things that would render a juror grossly unqualified. It's not a closed list. So if you start, uh, for example, from all the other areas of the law where we require jurors to be able to deliberate fairly, and the court is very wary of things that can harm that, can, 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 can nullify that. Prosecutorial summations, for example, that <coughs> seek to arouse emotions. Evidence itself that can unduly seek to arouse emotions. So the fact that here, this was not, as I said, an exogenous issue of, of bias, where it was something, for example, in Rodriguez that happened to the juror externally, this is something, again, that was so central to of voir dire itself, to the initial selection of jurors, to the evidence that they're allowed to hear and the arguments they're allowed to hear, to the closing arguments, to the actual court's final charge to jurors, which so, tell so them. You, you, hit a, you hit on a, a, an interesting point for me, is, are, is your argument, it, the weakness in the argument seems to me, and you can address this, is, is that you're seeking to apply a standard that would apply to voir dire to a juror at the close of deliberations. I'd like you to address that, because that seems to me, because this seems like an extension of Rodriguez, only because in Rodriguez, the lady was so explicit in her particular bias. Well, the reason, I, I, yes, grossly unqualified, again, let, let's use Rodriguez, if I might, as a counterpoint. Sure. And there, Yes, that juror was questioned about, <clears throat> as I said, an exogenous bias, and she was asked about it because it was something that happened apart from the trial. But one can obviously be biased and, and, and not be able to deliberate fairly because of things that are within the juror, his or herself. But what, 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 how did this juror mm -hmm. indicate in any way that type of bias? It, uh, what, okay. 
What I feel is uh, may be missing here is any indication of how uh, she talks about her emotions, but she doesn't say how that might affect her ability to <clears throat> apply, to find the facts and apply the laws the judge gave her. And that, that's, that's, I think, the, 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 the link here that's a little bit loose. Okay, well, first, um, I would say that the fact that, as she does say repeatedly, her emotions are impeding or actually nullifying her ability to deliberate fairly on the facts and the law. And she says it over and over, and she says she would be violating her oath. The fact that she was not explicitly asked about, well, which way is it going, I think if Your Honor is, is suggesting that, or asking her to get into the particulars, there's a danger there because once you start going down, I think uh, any judge, I think, who, who might go down that road would then start getting into the particulars of the deliberative process, which, which again, you're not supposed to do. But aren't and we creating a danger if we say that it's, it's you weren't explicit in, in the error, um, and, and yet we're, we're reading into it because of what you told us, in essence, that this is an emotional decision and it's <clears> difficult <throat> to make, and, and you're having a hard time with it because of the emotion involved in the decision without um, a specific um, disqualifying uh, admission. How are we not simply implying or inferring rather than, and, and then, from that step saying that was a gross uh, violation? Well, I guess I would say that, for example, um, these comments, comments such as this, are comments not as, as I, I wouldn't say strident, but as just explicit and, and repetitive, would obviously exclude a juror from the outset. Mm -hmm. This court's Johnson cases say that, Rodriguez and others, other cases make that clear. You cannot follow your oath to deliberate without passion, prejudice. So your argument is she wouldn't have been on the jury to begin with? Oh, absolutely not. In fact, okay. there were jurors. Let's accept were, that as were. true. Yes. Let's accept that as yes. true. But a different standard applies now. Well, again, it's, it's grossly unqualified in the, because this juror has said, she has said herself, and there's no question about her honesty. Mm -hmm. This was not a juror who didn't want to serve. This was a juror I, if I, you look, I agree who wanted that. to serve. That's true. Who said she could not do this. She could not follow her oath but, to deliberate fairly. We don't know which way it went. It, but, she was, in fact, I guess, a wild card. Well, no, put it, no one asked. Counsel, I'm just yes. a little confused about sort of this whole colloquy you have going on with the bench. I'm sorry? Doesn't, doesn't the judge ask or say to the juror that you would need to decide the facts as you see them and apply the law as I've stated it to you? And doesn't the juror then respond, but that's what I've been trying to do. And that's why I've come to this conclusion that I can't. I don't have it in me. Uh, what else would this juror have to say? And I'll ask the same question to the people. Um, I, that is the question. Can, can you decide the facts and can you apply the laws I give it to you? And she says, no. I thought I could, but I can't. And I'm telling you I can't. I, I no. Uh, other, no. No. I, my answer to your honor is no. She was as clear as she could be. I'm also struggling a little with why we're sort of limiting grossly unqualified to bias, and maybe we're not. But if you had a juror who was fast asleep, I think you would conclude that person's not biased, perhaps, but they're not fit to be a juror, and you would excuse them even if deliberations had started. Yes. And, and there's a case like that. Yes. Yes. Fire one of yes. This is a juror, again, Your Honor, I agree, who could not follow her oath as a juror, a juror who cannot follow her oath, as she said over and over, she could not do, is, not is no longer qualified to serve. She said she couldn't do it. Um, and if I might, uh, unless the court has more questions, I would discuss the other two points Please. for a moment. On the intoxication question, um, Obviously, uh, my adversary and I disagree with the reading of this court's cases, and obviously this court is the final arbiter of what this court's cases say, but our position is that this court has never held that if a uh, defendant is clear about the amount of drugs or alcohol or other mind-altering substances, let's say he has imbibed, uh, the timing, the, 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 the nature, and all of that, 
that if that is adequate, the fact that there is not also uh, some uh, other objective or some other indication that the person is, uh, let's say, not acting purposefully or is acting purposefully or isn't otherwise uh, somehow rendered diminished, that, 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 that the first part isn't adequate enough to get an intoxication Well, the charge. bottom line, I think, is that there has to yep. be another enough evidence right. that it interfered with the ability to form the requisite intent and all of those things that you're talking about. And, and what, we, what we may have indicated is that self-serving, uncorroborated general statements by the defendant, him or herself, are not enough. And the question here is, what more is there in this well, case? Well, um, again, I guess I would say, Your Honor, that um, <coughs> I would respectfully take some issue with um, a, a defendant's statements necessarily themselves eliminating the possibility because it is the defendant testifying. I mean, I think, again, the court has also said that it's a low threshold. The defendant's credibility is for the jury to assess. So if you have um, a, a client as here, and I, I know this court asked to hear uh, the client's uh, videotaped statement, which the jurors also asked to hear. That statement, like, like his written statement, talked about the specifics of his intoxication. Specifically, he thought that um, the deceased may have spiked uh, the, the second round of marijuana that they had, uh, that he had in any event at 4 a.m. And I believe he's on, heard on that video to say several times, he was mad high, he was high, he didn't know what was going on, his head was pounding. Um, and he just has sort of lost Doesn't lost he then contradict that by describing what he does after the murder? Well, again, Your Honor, now, now we get into the could, he, could it have subsequently, could he have subsequently engaged in, in uh, you know, directed conduct. Now, we all know, for example, people who are drunk drivers who may purposefully or, or seemingly be engaged in directed conduct. But again, we're simply talking in this instance about intoxication that can negative specific intent and not all ability to uh, get up and actually engage in, in other conduct. Thank you, Counsel. You could save the, your Peyton argument for your Thank rebuttal you, your time. Honor. Counsel? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> May it please the court, Eric Washer for the Bronx County District Attorney's Office. <clears throat> um, I would like to start with, with the colloquy because it's, it's not something that's preserved for this court's review. We do have to focus, as some of the judges have noted, on specifically what the juror said. But I think it's important to note that she had the opportunity to express what was bothering her, what was the source of her emotions, and she never did. She never clearly stated that there was something, some sort of bias that was going to prevent her from but, rendering but an impartial verdict. But is what order. matters for purposes of uh, the rule of law, what the consequences are as opposed to the motivation. I mean, again, uh, I'll say to you exactly what I said to, to defense counsel. Doesn't that language, that question from the judge or that statement from the judge that her, the juror's duty is to decide the facts as you see them, apply the law as I've said it to you, and her response, that's what I've been trying to do, and that's why I've come to this conclusion that I can't. I don't have it in me. Does it really matter why she doesn't have it in her when she's saying, I cannot do that? Well, I and think that is her duty and obligation as a juror. It's, that is her duty, and her duty is also to decide the case. I mean, at, at the end of that question that you quoted from, mm -hmm. uh, Judge Mogulescu says, that's your only concern, to, to apply the facts that she's found to the law. And if you've done that, that's, then you've done your job. Mm -hmm. And later on, he, he comes back to that. He says, I want to encourage you to go back with your fellow jurors and deliberate and exchange your ideas. And then she says, and I think this is important, she says, I don't think that we can. I think that what Judge Mogulescu thought, and he was in the best position to know, and I think that's why this court has said repeatedly in the Buford line of cases, that judges have a lot of discretion in making these kinds of determinations because they're so very So did she ever give an unequivocal assurance that she could be fair and impartial? Well, I don't think she had to, Your Honor, because that unequivocal insurance comes into play when there's some sort of invidious bias that comes out. Well, what if she had, as opposed to a bias against the defendant, she had a bias in favor of the defendant. She didn't want to put somebody, anybody in jail. It seems like a reasonable reading of, of what was being said there. Wouldn't she have to give an unequivocal assurance that she could, 
rule for the people if, if, as much as she could rule for the defendant. I, I think that would be true if she had made that clear, um, but she certainly so, didn't. So take a step back then. Mm -hmm. Once again, to Judge DeFiori's question, wouldn't, she have to, wouldn't you have to point to somewhere in the record where there was an unequivocal assurance that the juror was able to do that? Um, I, I don't think you would have to on the facts of this case, because mm -hmm. it's, it's different when you compare it to Rodriguez. Certainly in that case, you needed, I, I don't even think an unequivocal assurance would have saved the juror in that mm -hmm. case based on what she said. But that's where this court initially said, if you have some sort of invidious bias against the defendant, some kind of racially motivated bias, then the only way that that juror can continue to deliberate is if she can say unequivocally to the court, I can set all that to the side. But that's not what, we ha what happened here. And I, I think it is important to look at this in context. This was a long case. Um, the defendant testified. He very emphatically asserted his innocence. He actually uh, proposed that it was his ex-girlfriend who, who committed this crime. Uh, so it was a lengthy case. This was the fourth day of deliberations, and the juror calls the, the clerk first thing in the morning and says, what do I have to do to be excused? And I think that there's no question that at that point, she could have felt overwhelmed. She could have felt you know, drained by the whole process, by the weight of the decision that she had to make, and she just didn't want to go forward with it. And that's, that's really what Judge Mogulescu thought, the import of what she was saying was. And when he communicated that, um, that interpretation of her well, remarks... He, he, says that he says that the, this is the first time in his 45 years as a judge and lawyer before that that anything like this has ever happened. So, I mean, there are long deliberations. Jurors get tired of deliberating, but he even seemed to think, based on that comment, that he was witnessing something very different from, I'm just tired with this case. Well, I think he thought that it was unusual because he thought that she was saying that, I've, I, I know what the facts are, but I just can't bring, it, bring myself to say guilty. Now, I don't know if that is really something that's so uncommon. I mean, there are a lot of cases, particularly in the appellate division, that talk about the fact that very heated deliberations, even where people are raising their voices, they're angry. That, that's not something that, that's actually to be expected. You know, the, the jury instructions talk about this, the Allen instruction talks about this. So to the extent that the juror was feeling emotional at this time in this case, which was a very serious case, uh, very disturbing uh, factual allegations, I, the fact that she became emotional at that point, I don't think makes her irretrievably unqualified. Now, if she had said something like this, during voir dire, I think Ms. Solomon is correct. At that point, someone who is just of dubious partiality, the judge should probably err on the side of dismissing this person. But it's very different uh, once the jurors are sworn. And that's why the gross lack of qualification sta um, standard is important. It serves two interests. Why is that? During voir dire, it's speculation. It's what you think you can and cannot do. Now she's actually saying, I've, I've tried to do it, and I'm, I've reached this conclusion. I can't. This is now certain, but as I think, opposed to, well, I'm not sure, I think I could, maybe I can't, I don't know. But to the extent that she's saying, uh, Your Honor, what Judge Mogulescu thought she was saying, that I just don't have it in me to make this decision because she's, of the weight of it. She actually says, I took an oath that I can't abide by now. Like she took an oath to decide the case, uh, Your Honor. And I think at this point, she's saying, I don't think I have it in me to do that. But that would not be disqualifying, some sort of momentary, um, you know, lack of certainty as to her ability to decide, to decide the case would not be disqualifying. There's nothing about that that means she cannot render a part, uh, an impartial verdict. Um, so again, I think context was important, and I think that Judge Mogulescu was in the best, best situation to make this determination. Um, again, the standard, gross lack of qualification, it's very high by design. Ms. Solomon talks about the fact that it protects a defendant's right uh, to have a jury in whose uh, selection he's had a voice. That's true, but it, it also, by the same token, present, prevents uh, serious disruptions of trials, which is what would have happened here uh, based on just speculation about what might have been bothering her. I think uh, Judge Fahey pointed out that, w that we don't know uh, what was bothering her. She had the opportunity to say so. Um, Isn't the real problem the alternates had been dismissed and you're left with only a mistrial? I, I don't think there's any question that that's something that the court uh, had in mind, but I don't think that's necessarily problematic because I think that he did conduct a thorough colloquy with her. Um, the juror actually, I think, uh, I think Judge Garcia mentioned the fact that 
perhaps the court uh, interrupted the juror, but I think there are also points, at least one, where she interrupts him. So I, I think she had the opportunity to explain to the court if there was something that really bothered her, that really made her biased, made her unable to uh, render an impartial verdict, she had the opportunity to say so, she didn't. And this court's cases have been clear that sta equivocal statements that make, uh, that, that um, engender the possibility or the speculation of impartiality, that's not enough to dismiss a so, sworn So you're juror. saying the rule that we should clarify in this case, because you think it's already the rule, the rule that we should clarify in this case is that there should be an inquiry as to what is the motivation? Why has she reached this conclusion? If, for example, in this case, well, I think to what the, drives her? Well, I, I don't think this case would necessarily be an appropriate vehicle for that simply because uh, no one asked the judge to do anything more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Buford makes clear that defense counsel has an opportunity to participate. Yes, but let's say that. for future cases. Is that how we could avoid? Well, um, not necessarily because I do agree with Ms. Solomon that um, judges are often loath to get into that sort of thing. They may not want to start uh, delving into details from jurors that might get into the nitty gritty of, of deliberations. I think that they want to, they want to be probing, but they also want to be tactful. I and mean, that's, that's the rule that, that Buford talks about. Right, but in this case, this is not about the deliberations, right? In that, in that sense, it's, it, or do you disagree? Isn't the point that she's saying what, what's inside her, that her ability to do this, as opposed to what someone else has said, or the dynamics of the deliberative process? Well, I think what she's saying uh, it could have been both. I mean, her, her saying, you know, I don't think that I can come to a decision. You know, I don't think, as I said, I don't think we can when the judge encouraged her to continue and ex exchanging ideas with her fellow jurors, that it could have been both. It could have been something, it could have been her own reluctance to decide this case. It could have been something unpleasant uh, happening during the deliberative process, something that was stressful. That certainly would be logical based on the fact that they're coming now into the fourth day of deliberations after a lengthy trial. Um, Counsel, if we were to find on this record that the juror was un unable to be fair and impartial, is there anything beyond a motion for mistrial that defense counsel would have to posit to the court to preserve the issue? Um, I, I think that he preserved the issue by saying that, uh, in his opinion, she was grossly unqualified. I think that he could have perhaps inquired further. Um, if he thought that there was something that she was about to say or that something that could have been drawn out of her that might have clarified the nature of her concern, then counsel had the opportunity to do that in this case, but he didn't avail himself of it. Uh, just quickly as to the intoxication point, I don't think there's any reasonable view of the evidence in this case that the defendant was so intoxicated that he couldn't form the intent to kill or to seriously injure um, the victim in this case. Um, <clears throat> You know, when there's just no way to parse the statements that he gave where you can get to that point, for, that the jury could have got to that point. First, they would have had to, to conclude that he wasn't telling the truth on the stand when he emphatically accused his ex-girlfriend of killing the, the victim in this case. And then they would have had to go on and say, well, we believe some of the self-serving serving portions of his statement that talk about him being high, but we'll give him a pass on the other statements, which were clearly false. For example, he talks about the fact that the victim, Jemiah Hazel, was the one who really responded negatively to this marijuana that they supposedly smoked. But we know from toxicology analysis that she didn't smoke that marijuana. Um, he also talks about the the fact that he stabbed the victim a, cu a couple of times. Well, we know that he stabbed her three dozen times. There's simply no way that the jury was going to parse the statements that way and find, well, he was, we believe him when he said he was high, but we're discounting all of the other statements that are demonstrably false. It's also just important to remember that this would have been the third alternative defense submitted in this case. The first was, of course, the defendant didn't do it. The second was if he had, he had been justified. He was justified. And the third would have been, well, if he did it, I did it intentionally. I couldn't have formed the requisite intent because I was so intoxicated. Those three uh, defenses were all at odds with each other. There's just no reasonable probability the jury would have accepted intoxication. Uh, so in short, um, the judgment should be affirmed. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Counsel? Uh, just a, a few words, if I might, on the juror question. Um, I think it bears mention that uh, during the colloquy itself, the prosecutor, the on-the-ground person, uh, didn't make the arguments that are being made now uh, by my adversary. And in fact, the only arguments that he advances or the only suggestions are impl implying his recognition 
uh, that the juror needs somehow to be uh, instructed further about how emotions belong elsewhere in the case. So I think he was highly aware that this juror was, was severely compromised. And again, she didn't talk about what was going on in the jury room vis-a-vis -vis other jurors. It was about her. She herself was not qualified. Counsel did preserve it by saying this juror is no longer qualified to be a juror in this case. Counsel, just to, to yes. go back, and we don't have a lot of time, but to go back to something I think Judge Fahey touched upon earlier, um, we have had a number of cases where the people have successfully challenged a sitting juror and we've reversed. So whatever rule we make today for you will apply to people's challenges to jurors going forward, right? Well, again, we, we've said that, um, and I think well, this, this court recognized uh, in Rodriguez itself that when there is a challenge, and depending on who's making it, different rights might be implicated. But they have a right guess, to a yes, fair trial, yes, right? Yes, but I would also say here that in a way, no matter what the standard is, whether it's abuse of discretion, question so of law. So just to go back to my yes, question, sorry, though, wouldn't the rule apply to the people as well that we make today? Yes, because I think it's, it's a rule of fairness. This is a juror right. who cannot follow the law. And the law is, I think as various members of the court have stated, the ability to follow the court's instructions and decide the case without sympathy, passion, or bias. So in a yes. case where a juror came out and was indicating, I can't separate my emotions, but it was fairly clear that meant, you know, this is such a sympathetic case to me, a sympathetic defendant, the people, if we make the rule that you want us to make, could challenge that juror as grossly unqualified. Yes, yes, they could, because again, one is supposed to argue a case dispassionately. Now again, this court has also said that when it is the prosecution who is making the challenge over the defendant's objection, that there, are, that there is a heightened standard possibly for them. We raise that here, um, that uh, where, where it's, again, a, a prosecution challenge over a defense objection, or vice versa, when the people are, 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 the, are the moving party and the defendant is objecting, the defendant might have heightened, does have heightened rights there. This court has said that. Here, though, we're, this, this is something that is affecting the defendant's rights, and I think nobody wants a juror who cannot follow the law. Um, on, the, on the question of, uh, of intoxication, again, I just might point out, this was an odd verdict. Uh, this jury was out for four days, and despite the 38 stab wounds, acquitted the defendant of murder. So the jury obviously did have issues about his mental culpability, I think. I think that's fair to say. Had they been given an intoxication charge, they would have had, I think, more appropriate tools to be able to deal with that. On the Peyton question, if I might. Um, here, uh, we believe that the case needs to be remanded uh, for, for <coughs> Harris or an attenuation hearing. And the reason is that the prosecution did not meet its burden of going forward, which the hearing court judge found it was obliged to do. So there's no question about, about what the issue is here. And our point is simple. Um, start out with uh, the, the testifying officer said, perfectly fine, Peyton, you know, no Peyton violation. We knocked on the door, the defendant answered it, we asked him to step out. Peyton solved. Why doesn't this but, boil down to a credibility well, determination? Well, again, because here, I, I think be, because you have here, uh, um, when, when the, when the um, detective is then asked on direct, on, I'm sorry, on cross, about whether or not he and his partner had his guns drawn, he said he couldn't remember. Okay, but what, that, doesn't that go to his credibility? Well, I think at this point, it goes to whether going forward, he's established <gasps> that it was this anodyne little, you know, encounter, a perfectly voluntary encounter, as opposed to one affected by force. Would and it also, have been okay if the guns were drawn after he was outside in the hallway and they had... Um, well, afterwards, and, and, and after, after, after the arrest. That would be okay. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. But in order so to... So if he was out there, he was, they, they, they were getting the cuffs on him and, right. and he looked up and then he saw guns. 
after he's after he's cuffed yes that that would be that would we wouldn't have a complaint about that but that was not what was asked and that was not what the officer said he couldn't remember and in fact he also was a little wrong you know short on the facts about the number of other officers who were present so now we have more officers in uniform and when the defendant opens the door the prospect of guns already being drawn that as this court has held in minerly uh, minley does raise very clearly the prospect of a non-voluntary departure uh, from the apartment and a patent violation and the need for a remand. Thank you, Thank counsel. You.